This is T. Cooper. And Allison Glock Cooper, writers of episode 616, Lady Luck. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Well, after four years of trying, luck was finally on their side. Welcome to the award-winning The Blacklist Exposed podcast. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, and I rolled the dice twice in my life. I'll let my two kids tell you how that worked out. Thanks for joining us once again as we discuss number 69 on The Blacklist this week, Lady Luck, written by Allison Glock Cooper and T. Cooper and directed by Bill Rowe. Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found where? At theblacklistexposed.com. This episode cover off on our profiling question from last week. I think wrestler is going to be in for some trouble and then Mm -hmm. we'll get into the case profile with number 69. Insert your jokes here and then we'll get all of our (laughs) spatial agent Intel from you later on in the episode. Remember if you love insert your joke here and also (laughs) down here. Okay. Continue. You just insert was enough. (laughs) All right. <laughs> Patreon is where you could go if you're loving the show. Head on over there. P A T R E O N. Patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. Got a few new donors, supporters helping us out at the show. That's great. Fill the Fedora, throw a few bucks our way. All the links can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. With that, let's see how you answer last week's profiling question. Should wrestler pursue Katarina? 73% said yes, do it for Liz. 27% said, no, we don't want you to die, wrestler. Oh, that's a good point. Sylvia said specifically, yes, but don't do it for Liz. Do it for yourself. Susan said, yes, but do it for us. <laughs> well, that's greedy. You want him You want him to die, basically, is what I'm hearing, Susan. That's what I hear. Candace said, no, because it's none of his business. What? She's it's apparently... absolutely some of his business. She's, she's more on the red side of the house, I believe. He's a cop. <laughs> 100%. The only one doing the actual investigation. <laughs> GDB said yes, because it may lead to Dom, and then he can call Liz, uh, he can tell Liz about her grandfather. Mm, that'd be interesting. Like, hey, did I meet you before somewhere? <laughs> uh, Tatiana said, dude, he's the man, and he ain't gonna let this one slide. Rory said absolutely should. Not! It will only cause trouble for Liz. And, and lastly, Adia said, as long as it doesn't hurt Red, go for it. Okay, now next week's profiling question. Huh, you guys ready for this? Do you think Katarina's mother is still alive? Do you think Katarina's mother is still alive? Do you have a Do you have a theory? Do you have a theory? Uh, I'm going to say Katarina's mother is not alive. The house is around where the address and stuff, and the but uh, but the actual person, no, not alive in present so, day. So this person is not at the home because they have proof that the lady's alive, that this person that they're looking at is alive. Oh, is it proof proof that she was alive today? Yeah, she's at home and she's got a cat and a dog and she lives with her husband. Sounds like it was sounds like it's an address. Doesn't mean that they had like video camera surveillance of the last ten minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we'll find out. We will. We will. All right. Well, thanks for all that answer the profiling question this week. Now before one of us has a falling dream, let's get into this week's case profile. Have you ever had a falling dream? All the time. Really? Yeah, except the difference between me and my daughter, I have the falling dream and then you wake up. My daughter Uh has the falling dream where she actually lands and then she's still alive and awake and aware of everything around her, which is weird. You know, they have the, there's that old adage that if you die in a dream, you die in real life. Yeah. That's not true. That's not true. No. I've died so many times in dreams. Apparently that's all I do. I'm just... (laughs) Just imagining which way I'm going to go. All right. Well, we start with poor Henry Morris and the bet he's forced to make. He was paid a visit by Lady Luck, and if he wins, he gets $200,000. This is a guy I want to point out who pawned his wife's engagement ring that was given to her her by her grandmother. What an ass. No doubt. Kind of okay with Henry getting, you know, set up the river. Lady Luck needs Henry to kill a poor woman in a bathtub. Betsy Neagle. In recover, they basically here's how this whole thing works out. In recovery, these people go to a recovery called GART, G A R T, gambling, alcoholic recovery, and therapy, something along those lines. Basically, and, basically AA for gamblers. Right, right, and, and it covers a whole bunch of things. It's, she has a problem with gamblers. What she does is she finds those desperate from addiction and exploits them to do dirty deeds. 
She identifies her target, her next target, and that's Ned Green. And that's ultimately the FBI's connection to Lady Luck. So before we get into why she does this, what do you, do you, did you like this idea of the blacklister? Yeah, I thought it was an interesting concept of how they target the current person. And I didn't pick up on it on the first time when she comes in and sees Henry. It's like, gamble on yourself. I mm-hmm. was like, oh, gamble, like, like, can you actually pull it off? Can you do a good thing? Can you become a better person? And then the second time, it's like, oh, gamble on yourself because you're going to be the next bet and your ass is going to be grass. And I'm like, okay, I love this blacklister. This is a great idea. This is a great concept. And then when you find out the whole backstory about why it's happening, I just think it makes it even better. It, it puts this blacklister in the, I guess, creepy status is what we'll call it uh, on some of those, like maybe season one type level blacklisters, even though maybe it was kind of predictable in the episode outcome as it went along. But overall, I think I thoroughly enjoyed the story and I can understand, you know, that this poor lady's plight and what she's having to deal with after the loss of her son. Yeah. The only, the, I really love this. Okay. So I don't want to, I don't want to put it seem like I'm putting it down in any way, shape or form. Okay. But I come from a, a psychology background, so I care a lot about psychology. So the only thing that I wish we would have gotten a little bit more is the understanding of the addiction itself. Like, I get where she's coming from, but there didn't seem to be a whole lot of sympathy for the addicts. And I know a lot of people listening and watching probably don't have that. But um, as somebody who has grown up around psychology and understands how addiction works and how it can take over one's reason, sense of reason... It's always important to me as a, as a viewer to kind of get that balance. That That's the only thing I wish I would have. But as an idea, I think it's a very cool idea. And obviously, she's a very angry, bitter woman who blames the addiction as opposed to the man. She should blame the man, not the addiction. I want to know more about the apparatus that the husband was in. Like, was it a requirement to keep him alive or what was all going on? Because it seemed like he didn't need something so sophisticated when the daughter comes to see her dad at the end of the episode. Well, he's paralyzed. Right, he's right. paralyzed. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he didn't seem like he was like in some giant container system when the daughter sees him at the end of the episode, when she takes over the family business. So mm-hmm. why was he in this giant apparatus in the first place well, <laughs> instead I, of their I, apartment? I believe when they found him, she was trying to kill him. Like that was it. And that was the way to kill him, which is whatever he was in, but he needs a breathing apparatus, I believe to, right. to keep going. And she's kept him alive to torture him, basically, this entire time. And I, that was a cool twist, man, when told the daughter that <laughs> he's dead. Uh, yeah, I, your dad, I thought my dad was dead the whole time. What? What? So I guess I should explain that because we haven't done that yet. Now, Agatha Taiki's her name. Her husband, Lou, won $87 million. And her son died and her husband won the lottery. She uses the money as a slush fund to finance marriage. Explain to the audience why she blames her husband for her son dying or my, the money. My understanding from it was that the son was with him and because of that they were they went out to get a lottery ticket and the lottery ticket ended up being the winning lottery ticket and then there was an accident or something and that's what caused the son to die if I'm remembering correctly. And him to get paralyzed. And him to get paralyzed. While she was giving While birth. she was giving I birth believe. to the daughter. Right, 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 right. Yeah, which is just, I mean, it's a tragic story. Absolutely tragic story. Uh, and, and, it's, and, and you can hmm. understand where it comes from. Like some people be like, oh man, that's just tragic. And you just move on with your life. And then other times you just, I guess, snap in the case of poor Agatha here. I mean, it, it's not a healthy thing that she's done, but at the same time, she's under whatever she's under Pitocin and painkillers and everything else she's going through to like have the pregnancy. So She's got the whole hormone thing going on at the same. I mean, there's just a lot in her mind. So you can see how she could be fractured very easily from this incident. Like, seriously, you had to go get a lottery ticket while I'm giving birth and you're not even there to see your daughter be born. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, I can understand where she's a little pissed off. Yeah. And what's what's funny is I've actually I was the night before this episode, I watched a, a movie called Back Fork. It's a it's an independent movie on video on demand. You guys probably never even heard of it, but it deals with uh person who has a tragedy where their child dies and then they evolve into addiction and then it's like that whole like how far they'll go and everything else so it's like two nights in a row i've just been sad (laughs) dour and dour and steeped in addiction and just sad in many ways and the one thing that it was nice about this whole concept too is that it basically says 87 million dollars you're like well that could just forgive everything 
I don't need to worry about the fact that you weren't there. We're, we got $87 million. Mm-hmm. Um, money doesn't solve everything, people. That's that's your lesson for the week. You know, people always say that money doesn't buy happiness, but you know what? It'll rent it. It will rent it. So if you ever get $87 million and you don't want it because, you know, it's not going to buy you happiness, give it to me. I will be more than happy to spread joy all over the world with that money. <laughs> Love to. Ah, well, you could borrow it from your right. cousin. You could borrow it from your cousin Tim Peterson. All those I don't have from, a cousin Tim Peterson. What are you doing the show? Oh. Remember, he got all that money from his dad. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, she, uh, like I said, she uses the money as a slush fund to finance murders because her her son died and her husband was paralyzed. And I thought that the father was in on it, but turns out, no, he's not. He can't do anything. He's not in on it. He's just been a hostage for all these years. What a punishment, man. What a punishment. That is a bitter woman. What I thought was clever about this idea was that this is one of the rare blacklisters who um, isn't really benefiting in any way from what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, they're not gaining power. They're not gaining money. They're not gaining, I mean, if anything, they're spending money and they're they're giving away power. They're not really getting anything out of it other than satisfaction, personal satisfaction at the misery of others. Yeah, and I think this goes along the lines of maybe like a Frederick Barnes from season one mm. where he's just trying to find a cure for his son. He's just misguided, but he's trying to do the right thing. Or there was, um, I thought this one was very similar in style to the blacklister who was abused by his mother. Uh, I can't remember if that was season one or season two. And then he would basically bring other people in and started to do the abuse on them, which is a little more sickening, but he made his mom watch. If you remember that one. Yeah, I remember that. So I thought this was kind of the same thing. She's doing all this work and then uh, go ahead and making the husband watch it all go down and just, he can't do anything about it because of the, the paralysis. And then it also kind of had like a, I felt like a deer hunter kind of feel to it too, where, where he was the bad guy and she ends up becoming the deer hunter and taking up the mantle. And now the daughter's going to be taking up the mantle and keep the family business going. So Did you just reference a classic seventies film. Which one? The deer hunter. Well, the deer hunter was the episode with uh, oh. Liz and the thigh vice. Never mind. I got all excited. I thought Troy referenced the movie. <laughs> if the movie fits. Sure. That's exactly what I meant to do. <laughs> it doesn't at all. <laughs> I just sound like maybe I'm, you had the wrong movie, <laughs> but at least you were trying. I was really respecting it. And I think that's kind of why I like this episode, because there's a lot of, you know, similar things that we've seen in the blacklist over the years. And when you get six seasons in, it's hard to come up with new stuff and mm-hmm. still keep it interesting. So it pulls from things we already know, but yet presents it in a completely different way. And I think that's why it kind of resonates a little bit, because you're like, this seems familiar. I like familiar. And this is very much felt like a season one kind of setup, but I can see why people be pissed about it though, because other than the one guy that just happened to have some information about the third estate, there's real no connection to red in this entire thing. No. And, and which is, which is kind of funny. I mean, we'll obviously talk about red in a little bit, but it, it was the, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of villains that I can understand why they do what they do. And I can believe what they're doing, what they're doing. Like it makes sense to me that they have a logic behind them too. Because to me, a villain always has to believe what they're doing is the best way to go about things. Is Aaron and snapping his fingers on video right now to make me disappear? I do it every episode. <laughs> <laughs> never, never works. Uh, and here, I, I believe she does think she is doing the right thing. I believe she she thinks she's using that money to save families and save lives. And she has a, a sweet conversation with her daughter at the end and we come to find out it's not as sweet as we thought it was going to be. And daughters, apparently that, that apple didn't fall too far from the tree. Were you surprised by the daughter is going to take over the family business? In a way, I kind of think so. But at the same time, when she realizes the father's still alive, that instant anger and frustration of, you know, I, I never got to meet my brother because of you and you weren't at my birth because you were a gambler and she could fall right back in the same emotion and the same trap. So I, I buy into the fact that she was taking up her mother's mantle. Plus her mom did so much for her kid watching her all the time. So she can work double shifts. I, I, it's not a stretch for her to take over the family business. I think is what it is. I was, I was hoping it wasn't going to go that way. And there's some kind of redemption story in it, but at the same time, it also has that kind of parallelism going on as we learn about 
Katarina's mother potentially being around or alive or Mm -hmm. whatever Katarina did. And the fact that we know Dom was a KGB agent and Katarina's a KGB agent. So is this whole, it's in the family business, family blood kind of parallelism. I think I like that part of the episode too, that it paid off that way. Yeah. And I would recommend people don't look at episode names if you don't want to know anything coming up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So are you saying that because you did? (laughs) No, I'm saying that because actually I don't even know what they are. I, I legitimately don't know what they are, but I, I have heard people on the internets saying that the names give stuff away and I haven't looked, so I don't know. I'm just, I'm, so I'm giving you the advice, same advice I'm following, but basically I yeah. actually legitimately do not know what they are. Just because you think you know what's coming doesn't mean you really know what's coming. It's true. Well, I know you know, but I, Troy is instru- I am instructed Troy to never tell me. <laughs> That's right. I don't want to know. I'd like to be surprised. Don't watch promos. Don't want I don't want to know the names. I just show up on Friday night and let's see what happens. Magic. It's the burden I have to bear. Yeah, because you love to taunt me with it. You sure? <laughs> Next one's really cool. All right, let's go to characters. All right, music this week. We finally know where the music budget went because it's all this week's episode. First up, can, can I just point out, this might be the most on-the-nose song-wise that we've had in a long time. It felt like every song was saying exactly what was going on in the moment. Absolutely. Uh, we had first song was uh, Henry in Atlantic City when we hear My Diary by Five Alarm Music. Then we have Henry attacking the woman in the bathtub. We hear Gambling Man, which is right on the money by Lonnie Dongin. And, and also, uh, before we move on, that was a hard scene to watch. It I, was. That, it was very uncomfortable. I don't like that, that whole defenseless woman. I just don't like that. I mean, I get it. He had to do what he had to do, but I didn't like that. And it's one of those things, too, where you're talking about the filming and the technique and how do you mm-hmm. show a drowning to make the drowning look believable without actually drowning the, the actual actor. And so I just the, the quick cuts that, that they decided to use in it to make it look, it, it just looked very violent and very. Yeah, like, it was hard oh my to gosh. watch. Hard to watch. So and it's Sorry. on network TV on a Friday night. Mm hmm. So we have uh, Ned trying to off himself in the garage where insurance would pay for it, apparently, because if you have a policy long enough, it will pay out. Even if you commit suicide, Uh, we do have. (laughs) That's um, true. Why? Okay. I have insurance agents in my family and I verified this. Typically, if you've had a policy more than two years, they do cover it. I'm not encouraged. Don't do this. (laughs) Go seek help. Seek someone. Talk to someone. Always. I mean, that's I firmly believe that. I'm just saying that's a TV thing, man. That's not the case. It's a TV thing. Right. Sorry. I got to stop interrupting you. It's rude. No, no, you're totally fine. We just want to make sure everybody gets all of the correct information. <laughs> and of course, if you have a, uh, an issue where you're thinking about committing suicide, go watch Coy Stewart's uh, video with uh, the 1-800 number uh, from Logic. Uh, that's the number you call if you're thinking about suicide. Um, Absolutely. We have uh, the song My Everything Plays while he's in the car in the garage by Eric Vasquez, Leslie Stevens, Kristen, I guess, Aggie, and then Jeff O'Bannon. Then we have at the end of the episode, as Red and Dembe look on from the wings of the stage, we're treated to an acapella version of Every Breath You Take from the police. And a fun fact, they actually had to get the rights for the song from Sting. And then John Bissell actually worked directly with the choir for the track we hear in the show. Wow. And by the way, the number is 800-273-8255. It's 800-273-8255. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Whew, can't just can't just mention it and that's it. Right. As always, you can find the playlists on the website at theblacklistexposed.com, Spotify, Apple Music. They're both there. Go ahead and check those out if you want to hear the songs from this week. All right. Now we get to our characters. We're going to start. We're going to bounce around a little bit, but we're going to start with Smokey. You might think he's an important character, but it turns out he's just... He's an important Splat. character for some. His new name is Splat. Uh, he's uh, he's Splat's learning back. Say. Yeah, he's uh, he's what do you call no a man with no <laughs> no man with no uh, arms and legs thrown out of plane? Splat. Uh, oh my gosh. Remember those old jokes in school? Do you remember those? And he probably doesn't have them anymore after he hit the ground either. <laughs> what do you call a man with no arms and no legs in a river? Bob. No arms and no legs on your doorstep. <laughs> Matt. Matt. I miss school. All right. These days, somebody's offended by that. All right. So is uh, learning backgammon from Dembe. He is doing that. Were, were you happy to see Smokey back, by the way? Absolutely. I love Smokey. This was almost kind of heartbreaking that Smokey is no longer with us anymore. Shut a tear. Take a moment. Okay. Um, moment's over. 
When did you know he was in danger? Because I knew in the first conversation the way Red is, I was the shocked, way he's acting. Shocked that what? Red didn't shoot Smokey at the bar. I was waiting the whole time as he's just mixing the drinks, going along. I'm like, okay, it seems obvious he's going to kill the the guy who's got the drug ring going. Like that's the obvious choice. Mm-hmm. And then the minutes are like, yeah, when I was like hanging out with his kids, I'm like, oh snap, Smokey going down at the bar. Red's going to shoot him in the head right here. But nope, they ended up shooting the other guy and then saved it for later, which I think was the better choice because it was the whole conversation of the flying dream versus the falling dream. And then, of course, the ending sequence was. Yeah, oh. well, he didn't say he didn't say he was hanging out with his kids. He just said he had kids. Don't yeah. kill him. He new, kids. Yeah, new kids, whatever. Yeah. 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 So I, you, I, I, when did you know that he was in trouble? Because I'm telling you, I knew it like the first conversation. You could just tell he was like, well, how bad would it be for whoever was uh, screwing you over? How how, how bad are they going to kid it? <laughs> no, I didn't. I picked it the, when he said the whole like, yeah, he's got kids. I went Burr, like a dog. <laughs> I was like, Burr. I thought you didn't know I'm Smokey. Yeah. Bye bye. That was too bad. So uh, he was the logistical mastermind. Apparently he was while Red was in prison. He was. Letting people use the trucks and his transportation to run drugs, which apparently is a business Red doesn't want to be in, but running guns and everything else he does is okay. I don't quite understand the logic here. Guns take out other people. Drugs only hurt yourself. Then wouldn't he be more for drugs? No, I think that you, <laughs> the self-infliction, the self-wound, he had that whole you know, committing suicide is like a bomb going off and it ripples around everyone around you from the Kate May episode. I think he, I think he's very much against self harm. Just to hurt everybody Just else. Just hurt everybody else. <laughs> There's a hypocrisy of epic levels involved here, but you know it, it's whatever. I mean, I feel like Red can be a walking hypocrite <laughs> sometimes. So sometimes I get it. Yeah. Uh, you've had you talk about the falling dream. You ever had a flying dream? I've never had a flying dream. I didn't realize there was such a thing as a flying dream. Where you're, I've had I guess, a, flying. I've had like the out of body experience dream where you like you can see yourself sleeping like you're like just hovering over your body in your bedroom kind of thing that's creepy but yeah never had a actual yeah yeah look it's a cloud hey that cloud looks like a oh it was a brick wall sorry (laughs) what's your name splat uh speaking of splat Smokey got con aired or air force one depending on your movie preference he got thrown out of a plane is what i'm saying love it what did you think about that moment? Okay, so Demi's got a problem with him making an example out of Smokey. Do you have a problem with him making an example out of Smokey, or was it the right example to make? Maybe the killing was a little bit strong, but at the same time, Smokey lied. And Red said, I hate lying more than anything. And then he had the whole con- the whole conversation about uh, making a lie even worse is worse. So, yeah, I, I think that at that point, there really wasn't much choice for Red, and his hands were tied. But killing, dropping him out of a plane where nobody's going to find his body. Oh, they're going to find it oh, over here, over there, over there, over there. I mean, he, he seemed very pristine where they found him, but uh, I, he would have a hell of an indentation <laughs> because of the, the sheer velocity. Not to, but, men- uh, not to mention the wolves in the woods that are going to come find him and the coyotes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't. I don't know if it was necessary. I mean, some sometimes I wonder if Red should be. I mean, this is a great illustration that hey, remember Red's a bad guy, you know, which which I like because we haven't had that in a while. I mean, sometimes you get caught up in how fun Red can be that you know we forget we've had this conversation a hundred times where people want to you know because they love Red so therefore he can't be a bad guy because you love him. Well, no, I mean, there's a lot of really charming people that are evil or bad, do bad things. You can have. Good intentions and still do bad things. I mean, we all have friends like that, right? They they mean well. They they try to do well, but they always do something dark. That's kind of what Red is. And and here I don't know if smoke killing Smokey is the, the right way because I have a feeling Red would take advantage of an opportunity like that. Yeah, I, I would think he would too. Mm-hmm. Well, so if the situation was reversed, and I think Dembe understood that, it, or it seemed like, where he realized, like, hey, this is. I mean, he's saying he'll make it right, but. Red at that point is saying, I can't ever trust you because you're always going to be looking out for yourself. And I'm like, well, so would you. But I guess he's the boss. So whatever. That's right. And then he's got so blind to the people that are closest to him between Liz. It's oh, my gosh. I'm so glad Liz didn't do it again. And oh, Dembe, you're a man of above reproach. You would I never do knows. that to me. I think he knows Dembe knows. I hope he knows because he sure knows that wrestler knows something. 
And, yeah, and if you, and if you could say in one, in one side of that coin, he's like, I know that wrestlers onto something and then say he's completely oblivious to Dembe and Liz. Well, see, I don't know if he knows that Dembe knows it's Liz, but I, th- I believe he knows that Dembe knows. I also believe he believes Dembe knows it's wrestler or thinks it's wrestler. I, I believe red thinks wrestler is the one that turned him in. Could be because, because of in court, Wrestler's the one that gave the obvious tip that he knew he wasn't Raymond Reddington, and Red caught that. That sure was did. obvious in that episode. So to me, if I'm Red, based on what we've seen in the television, on the TV, on the on the box, uh, I'd be looking at Wrestler more than I would be. And I I believe Red would think Dembe wouldn't want him to know that because he wouldn't want Wrestler to get killed. And this goes back to the comment we made about what you think you know, you might not know about future episodes, mm-hmm. because I was pretty sure that this was going to be a Red and Dembe confrontation by the time this episode was over, the way the promos and the write-ups and everything was Ah, uh, does the said. promo play that up? Oh, yeah. Uh, like Dembe, I told you, stop watching it! <laughs> Dembe's not going to like what Red's going to do next. And it's like, and then we had the whole C2E2 thing, where, where does Dembe's loyalties lie? It's like, you're going to see. It, like, it just amps it all up, and then you're like, oh, man, they didn't do anything. Well, they might do that next week, but in terms of promos, technically they didn't lie because, you know, he didn't like what he did to Smokey. So, but it's always misdirection. They're not, they're, whatever they're teasing never happens. So just stop believing the promo. <laughs> you already know you're going to watch the episode. Just wait. I'm telling you, it's so much more fun. I never get, I, every time I watch a promo and then watch an episode, I'm disappointed. When I just watch an episode, I'm not. But yeah, you watch I, the Star Wars trailer like 10 times. <laughs> I watched it like twice. I wasn't that excited about that one. But Veronica Mars coming back, now that my fist started pumping. Yeah, yeah. Taser mm-hmm. and all. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> that was I'm a, I'm the lone wolf. Everybody's talking Star Wars and I'm over here going like, but you guys, Veronica Mars just dropped the trailer too. Worst marketing team ever to drop their trailer <laughs> the same day as Star Wars. What were you thinking? Uh whatever. Back to Blacklist. Uh Cooper doesn't really do anything. Aram. A few PC updates, so we can kind of gloss over them um, this week, unless you can pick up something that they did that I didn't catch. At least Rom's back in a good frame of mind. Well, yeah, I mean, he's he's probably got a part-time job. He's probably delivering pizzas on his bike or something for make that money back for Red. Oh my gosh, that's right. The debt that he owes. <laughs> yeah, he's got like 56 grand he's got to pay back. That's right. All right. Now we're moving on to wrestler who I think is going to have quite the arc coming up. Uh, we meet MJ. Turns out it's not Michael Jordan or Mick Jagger. It is this dude who I don't know at all. Who seems really, really young to be involved with the Katarina task force from so long ago. <laughs> you know what? He's just, maybe he's just aging well. Anton Vlav claimed Katarina Rostova was at the Cross Sound Ferry Terminal two weeks after her death, but that was never confirmed. So it was never confirmed. Uh, then we get wrestler. So this is him basically researching Katarina Rostova while he, he's doing this while the rest of the episode is playing out. Then he tries to find this information about Katarina's mother or Katarina herself. And he straight up lies to Liz. What do you think about that moment? Because he did lie to her and tell her that I'm not. I, I ordered this like weeks ago before we had this conversation. So I'm not actually looking into your mo- to your mother or who Raymond Reddington is. That's not what I'm doing. And she kind of was on like backing him like, hey, I understand why you have to do this, but thanks for understanding. So it, I don't know what she said. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there's a small lie in there. He could have, I mean. No, no, no. We're not having this debate again. There was no small lie. He flat out lied to her. He didn't order it weeks ago. He just ordered it. He flat out lied to Liz. There's no gray area. Yeah, but it's just spinning a story. That's a lie. <laughs> Why do you have such a problem with what lies are? Maybe it's, what, only, it's only years what do you of sales, feel? probably. I don't know. How, how do you feel about him fibbing to Liz, however you want to word it? He's he's got every right. She even says it at the end of the episode. He's got every right to dig into it. I mean, this was a man that he chased for five years. Who's not the man that he thought he was chasing for five years. His fiance is dead because of it. He's got every right to look into the case. Liz can't dictate to him what he can and can't do. But then she pulled the what? Well, thanks for telling me you're not going to do it. Yeah, because they're partners. There's still some level of respect that needs to be had there. So you could trust your partner out in the field. But he doesn't have it because he lied to her. I understand. 
Yeah. So how do you, how do you feel about that? Wrestler flat out lied to Liz. I want to. Yeah, mm. I want to know the truth. I'm going to keep digging. Like Liz is a coworker. Coworkers quit. Coworkers get hired. New partners come in. You partnered with Mirror. You partnered with Samar, literally, and then partnered with uh, with Megan again with uh, Liz. So yeah, I I think at this point he's entitled to an answer. Well, I think we all are at this point. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest i'm sitting here in wrestler shoes going you're damn right if you if you don't look at that folder i'm gonna beat your ass i swear to christ and uh he looked thank god yes he did all right so here's what we got from the information that he has and the information that he had with m or the meeting he had oh, with wait, mj b- b- before you go there we should say yeah. uh the cross sound ferry uh if i'm remembering my locations of my ferries correctly on the east coast we were talking about how there was a possibility of going from the uh, Rayoboke beach house over to Cape May and how there's a ferry that goes from Virginia over to New Jersey. But the cross sound ferry is actually a ferry that goes, I believe from Connecticut to long Island. Yeah. It goes from new Eng- new London, Connecticut to Orient point long Island. So not the same ferry that would have, that Katerina could have caught had she been fleeing from the fire to go to Cape May. So just to kind of give people reference of where all that stuff is on the map. Okay. And you can take it for as low as twenty five sixty five. <laughs> I might have, I might have been Googling it as you were talking. So oh, there you go. Good enough. All right. I didn't just pull that out of my boy. Aaron is really researched. <laughs> Aaron Googles fast. I, all right. I just know that I, I remember the name because we have an office up there in Connecticut. So I was like, hey, I've heard that name before, but that's nowhere near Virginia. No. Well, I mean, it's not too far i guess but two weeks later you know it's the same it's easily traversable in two weeks yeah it's a train ride from virginia up to newark yeah. so okay so here's what we learned that she can't he doesn't find proof that katarina is still alive but what he does find is a connection to possibly her mother virginia lopatin lopatin something like that uh married tim king in 68 lives in chicago Woohoo. Chicago shout out with a dog and a cat. Uh, it says she's 81, but Katarina is 59. Mom and dad did go into hiding. We know where dad is. We know who Dom is, and he worked with the KGB. So this could be her mother and that Katarina put her in hiding, which means I guess mom and dad aren't together because she's married to someone else. So what do you feel about that information about grandma? Yeah, or they had to split apart because if they would find For both hiding. of them, they'd be tortured yeah. and they would find Katarina, which then it would find Masha. So they had, she basically, it's kind of the same thing of splitting up Jennifer and Naomi in a parallel world, if you can think of it that way. Right. So, um, information's great. Uh, we actually get, uh, 1991 comes out of Liz's mouth, uh, when she's screaming at wrestler in the office. So we have time frames again, and we have dates and numbers and fun with math that everybody's going to be working on for the next two weeks. Yeah. Somebody's got a, a, a whiteboard that has a whole bunch of lines and arrows on it. As f of x approaches h, as a limit approaches zero. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's interesting because we get the whole uh, the whole my mother conversation. Red was standing over her mother's grave, and everybody's like, "Oh my gosh!" It's like this can't be Katarina's mother. Or the Red Arena theory is like totally in the trash now, and blah blah blah. And I'm like, all of the stuff that Red says again is just a story and a character moment and a somewhat half truth because he could say that he had to stand over the grave to convince people that the mother was dead in order to keep his mother in hiding potentially. So oh, dear God, there's, there's a lot of ways you could take it. So just, whatever, whatever, how far will you reach to keep your theory in play? How far? I'm just saying it's plausible. How far? It is plausible, plausible, that's, plausible. That that you just said is not plausible. That's ridiculous. They, I'm, I'm saying they that. had a funeral for Liz and Liz was still alive. There's precedent in the show. I'm just saying. Ridiculous. <laughs> just ridiculous. How far you'll go to, because you're so committed. I, I admire your commitment, but my God. <laughs> All right. But the fact that we're talking yeah. about daughters and mothers in this episode, and then you have information about daughters and mothers. I thought that was a really nice parallelism too, that we got that information in this episode. Um, and going back to the opening of the show, when we said it took four uh, four years for this to put together, they've actually been trying to work on Lady Luck for four years to break this to actually make it into a story that works. So, what do you mean? Like this was going to be an idea back in like season two, 
How'd you know that? How'd you find that one? Uh, uh, John pinged me o- over the evening last night, and he was like, hey, okay. this is a story we've been trying to put out for four years. Cool. And it's like, so the fact that it landed here in this moment with the kind of ties to mothers and daughters as we approach what we think based on some stuff that we've seen on the internet, I, I think it's an interesting placement that it finally landed here and was able to work. I like it. I think it's a very clever idea. Uh, like I said, it just need a, a little more balance on the addiction standpoint, but that's also a personal thing. Sure, sure. Because we're not telling that st- the story here. It's not really that story. It's not about the addict. It's more about the manipulation of the addict. So I get why they wouldn't, but it's just a it's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, Dembe is very disappointed in Red for killing Smokey. We kind of talked about that, and will convince any whomever knows who turned him in to come forward. That that is Red's plan. And Dembe looked noticeably shaken, worried, concerned, fearful. I don't know. How did you interpret his reaction? Contemplative. Mm, nice word. I don't think he was... Uh, Dembe doesn't get shook? Come on, it's Dembe. <laughs> oh, no... I remember his episode. Yeah, he got shook. <laughs> he was running all over the place like, I gotta save my ass! <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> he wasn't shook. He was just trying to prove that... He was just trying to prove to Red... You know, that he would never betray him. It wasn't a shook. It looked pretty shook while he's running down he the got street. Smashed saying, I got in the head by pool balls from Solomon, and he still wasn't shook. <laughs> All right. I'm just saying, he, got, he looked a little shook there. He's like, oh, man, I don't want to be on Red's bad side. All right. So are you are you worried for Dembe in any way, shape, or form? This, is, this goes back to the would he actually kill or not kill Kaplan. And Dembe, as you get closer, right? Dembe is like the next step closer to then Liz would be the next step. So the fact that both of the people that he thinks he trusts the most are the ones that are actually betraying him. That's an interesting dilemma that I think we, I mean, if red stays true to character, he would have to go through with an execution because that's what we've, he killed Smokey for less, right? So so a, a big turn like that, you'd have to think that red would go through with it. If, if the end game of this whole thing is that there's really no relation and red's just in it for himself the whole time, then that's how it's going to have to play out. At the same time, I would hope that the two of these people specifically in Red's life and the fact that he's always been talking about, can I ever get back to the light? Can I have that just one more time? Maybe these are the two things that in the the exact situation that actually brings Red around back into his humanity again. Mm. I I could see that, but I I firmly believe Red's going to Red. So (laughs) somebody's going to die. And I wouldn't, I would actually kind of find it not good, but interesting if just from a story perspective, a narrative perspective, if Dembe is pressed by Red because he knows he knows and he uses wrestler to wrestler's name to protect Liz. So he covers two bases. You know what I mean? Well, and I he just, doesn't have any loyalty to wrestler. He doesn't care much about wrestler. He don't he doesn't care. But he would just if he could just throw him because Red already suspects wrestler and he just said, yeah, it's wrestler, not Liz or whatever. You know, I think that would go against the character of Dembe, though. Dembe seems to be the honest, truthful, tried. Well, he's lying. It also kind of goes against his character to protect Liz, too. I mean, I mean, yes and no. Because he's protecting Liz because it's Red's wishes that Liz never gets harmed. Yeah, it's the same. It's the the same motto that um, Kaplan was working off of. And the same token, he knows in his heart Red would never hurt Liz. Never, never, never. So why wouldn't he just tell her? Tell him. It hurts her every single week, but not telling her what the hell's going on. Well, I'm not arguing that. That's that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fact. But I, I'm just speaking in, in respect to this. He knows she. that's the one person he's not going to punish the way that he wants to punish the person that turned him in. Sure, sure. So there's no concern there at all. But if, if for whatever reason he has that concern, then I could possibly see him throwing someone else under the bus to take her place. And maybe because that'll benefit because he's already searching for answers already. So it'd take care of two stones. Now, Dembe would totally throw Jennifer under the bus and deflect that way because that's like a half truth. Oh, that would be horrible, man. She's innocent. She, she's not even involved in this. She already ran away. She's the one that told the girl to call it in. No, I, Liz already took responsibility. It's Liz. Liz right. did it. Liz done did it. It's Liz's fault. Yeah, but if, they, but, but, but if we have to go to the Crosstown Ferry up in Connecticut, Long Island, we'd be right in Jennifer's backyard, so it'd be an easy way to turn her in, and if you're trying to break a story. Mm, I don't know. 
it'll be interesting to see what happens. And that'll be next week, I'm sure, or the week after, or season finale. I don't even know when we're going to get it, but it's coming soon. We've only got, like, what, six weeks left? Uh, Yeah, we got... Well, Aaron doesn't want to know the names, so we got The Thing next week, and then we got an episode, and then we got a special episode in a two-hour uh, in two weeks, and then, yeah, boom, boom, boom. We've got That's a two-hour in two weeks? Two-hour in two weeks. Like the week after this coming Friday? Correct. Ooh, that's going to be a good one then. I yeah, bet you. Good Friday episode will be standalone. And then the week after Good Friday will be a two hour event. It will be Good Good Friday. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ah, all right. Liz lying to the daughter. Um, I get that. Um, connections, connections, connections. There's a lot of connections here uh, because they're basically talking about families and family. Um, yeah, family. <laughs> And what it all means and who you can trust and you can't always trust family. There, there's a lot of that. So we got that. Did you get anything else from Liz other than the asking Henry about the third estate? That's about it. Okay. And just the, the the stuff we've already talked about in relation to wrestler. Right. Okay. So we'll see what she gets more to do. I don't think she really got a lot this week. Um, but third estate she, is still in play. It like. is. It is. Yeah. And she, and she keeps, uh, keeps to her game with the whole flip-flopping. I like your wrestler. I don't like your wrestler. I like your wrestler. <laughs> she, she, I don't think she flip flopped in that moment, but you know, people are going di- to disagree. I, I believe what she said was very clear that you have a right to, I'm thankful that you're not, we had a deal and you're honoring it. And he's not honoring it at all. He's totally lying. He's going to get himself killed before the end of the year's out. If he doesn't stop, but she doesn't know that. That's kind of bummed that he didn't be like, yeah, but I found your grandma. <laughs> Let's go see your grandma. Maybe you can get an engagement ring from her. <laughs> and then I'm going to pawn it <laughs> like Henry. All right. Red. We've already talked about him quite a bit. Uh, we've got a lot of Spader, Spader gnarly moments in this one where he's just, he's cold blooded. And maybe this Check was uh, the throwback I felt to like season one, because this very f- felt reminiscent of the uh, post Ansel Garrick searching for Mr. Gray, Diane Fowler, all of that coming back together to remind us of that sequence that he's a bad guy and he's going to take people out. Yeah. And he did pretty cold blooded too. I mean, that poor Martin. <laughs> all right. So he's looking for the person who turned him in. He's asking all these people who have taken advantage of him while he was in prison. Carlo is one guy who tried. Now he's paying 15% extra. That is bad a bad plan. Total, that is a total parent move, by the way. What's that? Do you want two weeks? Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> Totally is. Well, now we're up to 15. Want to go for 20? Want to go for... Okay, we're good. Thank you. <laughs> go to your room. <laughs> Love that sequence. That was fun. Oh, what a pepper. We got, we got a G. Gordon Liddy lesson this week while he's holding his hand over a flame. And I like that he didn't do the, the cool villain thing where they do it for five minutes or whatever. He's like, ow, I don't like it. <laughs> Fire bad. I don't like to be burned. Fire bad. I, Fire, wonder, I, wonder, I wonder why. Then we get him shooting the poor drug cartel mule or whatever, Martin. How would you feel about Martin getting killed? Because now we know he has kids. Poor guy. Uh, one of them was going to die. That's all I knew. I just didn't know which one. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I knew, I knew I was glad at least together. someone got a bullet. I mean, come on. He's like not going to go around flying his jet all over the country trying to find these people and not one person's going to die in this episode. That'd be a real letdown. I, I still don't get the whole... I, I can sell guns and do all the other things, the awful things I do, but drugs is where I draw the line. Maybe it's just, maybe get... it's just methamphetamine specifically. Something about methamphetamines that he ran into in his life in the past, mm. or like he doesn't care about crack cocaine or heroin or any of that stuff. He'll traffic that crap all day, but methamphetamine. Well, no, I don't think he does because throughout the series, he's he's frowned at drugs. So maybe it is a self harm thing you talked about. Maybe it just it is self harm. He doesn't. He likes shooting other people. Sounds like a good question for a season wrap up interview. There you go. Hey, there you go. Keep that on. Keep that in mind. Uh, at the end, we find him coming to Janet's program at Shermer. Can you refresh people on who Janet is? Janet was, I believe, the lady that was involved in the Gregory DeVry episode. That's the uh, imposter Fred, uh, where Red's mm-hmm. actually trying to get back into the good graces, which is also kind of a throwback in this case. Like, oh, hey, Red, how many lives do you have? I can't believe you escaped this one. And he's kind of going around and reestablishing his his uh, his uh, P marks. In his organization. Well, he gave her a chance and she paid it off. Sure did. Sure did. And he, he liked hearing that he was a great man. Ego will get you <laughs> very far. And stroking the ego gets you even farther. 
Absolutely agreed. So that brings us to the end of the episode. Anything else from Red that you got here? I mean, I, I really, I, I we've had kind of fanciful, fun loving Red the last couple of weeks because he's out of prison and everything. You know, last week with the Rom, a little bit he got a, l- a little edgier, but it still was kind of jokey in many ways. Here we got cold blooded. I'm in charge of my business, Red, and even took out one of the guys that saved his ass. You know, last year. So, how'd you feel overall about uh, Spader bringing it back to Red? I would say the drugs are working. <laughs> he seemed to be he seemed to be his old self this week. Not as tired, more in, more in the game, and yeah, yeah. So maybe whatever he's taken from uh, from the pharmacist is actually working. See, I I really prefer this version. Of, I mean, I know both versions are the complete red or whatever, but I really love the darker version of red because you that's where he's the loose cannon and you don't know what he's going to do. I mean, people and love that part of him. Like, I love that part of him. That's my favorite part of, of the character is just watching him do things that people shouldn't do. <clears throat> and I love fans because then they justify why it's okay for him to do it. If somebody else did it to him, they would be the sons of bitches. But, <laughs> but because it's red, it's okay. We love him. He's okay. It's like that one scene where he dumps the vodka all over the guy and then puts the cigar in his mouth and lights it. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, oh, the suspense is killing me. And then just shoots him. <laughs> like that scene like defines Raymond Reddington to me. I'm glad because we haven't had, uh, we need some more of those scenes, some more viciousness. Yes. Let's show him just going all, to all great lengths to, to find out who did it. All I right. Can't, I can't wait to see what he does to Anna McMahon if they go face to face. Well, I mean, he doesn't really hurt women. So... You have to have somebody else do that. That's true. You have to have Liz do it. Liz will go face to face with her. Maybe. I, I remember Ruin. She or, can beat her ass. Wrestler could do it too, I suppose. Yeah, I don't think Wrestler has the same problem. Like, He's he, just like, you're a criminal's a criminal. He killed Hutchins. <laughs> he could do it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll take a quick second to say thank you to those of you that are supporting the show by going to Patreon, P A T R E O N. That's patreon.com slash the blacklist G S M. We have a whole audio version of the panel from C2E2 there for you to plug into your podcast player. Plus, there's also an after the panel special. So all of that is available, and we try to give you, if we get any interviews, we'll try to get them there first. So if you want to support us on Patreon, please do so. There's a, there's a lot of great stuff already there, and we do thank everybody that does support us. And we want to say thanks to Doug, Marilyn, and Lacey, as well as Leone, Brandon, Jim, Stacy, and Florian, all for being amazing supporters. You guys rock. Totally appreciate everything you do. Also, shout out to Kevin, Paulette, Priscilla, Isabel. Where is it? Isabella. I'm going to say both just to cover the bases. Richard, Nell, James, Judy, Rachel, Tony, and Sharon for being amazing special guests for supporting us and the podcast. Again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. Fill the fedora. Find the links anywhere it says support the show. Plus, you get rewards for yourself as well. It's going to be awesome. So we'll be back with Special Agent Intel right after this. There's a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. Within that dimension is a new podcast from Golden Spiral Media dedicated to the Twilight Zone. Join me and Robert as we discuss the new series from CBS All Access and the original series we all love so much. It's called The Fifth Dimension. Subscribe today wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, Dembe Loyals, this is Hisham Taufik. You are listening to Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Diddy Elliot, she says, I guess we know now why Smokey wasn't at Red's party. <laughs> That's a good point. He was manning the switch tracks for the trains to get where they needed to go. Eek, good call. James Steen said, I thought the three of us had been saying for years that Katarina was probably alive. That's Actually, in stuff that I wrote up two years ago. So, Smokey didn't have a parachute. I knew y'all were up to something living in Chicago. And I expect Troy more than Aaron because Troy just moved recently. But which one of y'all's house is Virginia going to be staying at? Um, No collusion. Um, That's why I moved. <laughs> There's no collusion at my house. That's all I'm saying. No collusion. None. No Russians here. Keep moving. All right. Tatiana Reddington. Yeah. I'm not liking this red, man. Smokey was one of the most colorful characters on this show. Sorry to see him go, but this red making an example of Smokey question mark and the drug runner question mark. Is he doing this to get Dembe to talk? Is he on a controlled rampage? Is he acting like Lady Luck vengeful? 
I love this red, so I'm cool with it. Except for I don't get the hypocrisy on the drugs, but I already talked about that at length. Yes. All right. Sue Athens said, poor Dembe. He is now a stone killer like his mentor, but at least Reddington isn't looking sick anymore. Mm. Last week, he was popping pills and injecting himself and God knows what. This week, bartending and looking healthy and hearty. Yeah, it does seem like the drugs are working, right? Seems like it. Hmm. At some point, we got to find out what that is. Yeah, we do. You know what? I, I feel like it's going to be one of those plays where Liz is really mad at him and he uses that to, for a little sympathy. You know, I'm sorry I killed Rustler, but I've got this problem. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me a little itchy trigger fingery. Sorry. This James Spader uh, impression brought to you by Aaron at the Black Post. Yeah, Deco. it's a stellar spot on impression. You're welcome. Wendy Davis, uh, Davies, I have a feeling this episode storyline was done someplace else. It felt so familiar, except they ended it with a twist. R.I.P. Smokey, I'd guess Red has been smoking dear old Smokey out as having double cross Red. Uh, so why hasn't Dembe told Red about Glenn wanting to split Red's fortune 50-50, huh? Question. Well... Uh, I mean, he he was joking, right? Right. All right. I think Red knows Dembe knows who the betrayer is. We agree. Little chummy chat overlaid with the police is every breath you take. Seems like a familiar reminder and warning to what happens to those who betray Red. I'm loving this wrestler arc of trying to find Katarina. It's like we've been let in on a secret that Red and Liz are not aware of. I hope it continues to the season's end. I like that we have a potential one-upmanship on Red and Liz. Yeah, that never works out for whoever's trying to one-up them. I'm just pointing that out. It's true, true. Donna Fisher said, it sounds like Katerina's mother is alive. Why doesn't Dom know that? I don't think Katerina is alive. I think we get the story in Kate in a Kate May like episode. And I think Dembe and Liz will blame Jennifer. That's how they get out of the situation. That's man. I would, I would lose respect for both of those characters to a great extent. If they threw it at that Jennifer, cause she walked away. She walked away yeah. and Liz can be like, Eh. wimp mm -hmm. Bianca this is not my favorite episode it felt like a cross between criminal minds and the godfather <laughs> Red's episode long rampage could have been done in a montage and gotten the point across I think he knows Dembe knows and I wish the m message he's sending could be dispatched to Liz stat okay. I agree with that I agree with um, parts of that Yeah, I, I would have loved maybe like he did 10 people he was going after and sure enough he lands he kills somebody lands kills somebody over some really sweet music that kind of would have been fun to pick up the episode a little bit the montage sequence. I like that idea. Neil Ottenstein said it was the wrong example. Does Red suspect that Dembe knows more than he is saying? I think we all had this dread for Smokey during the episode and we're sad it came true. I was not surprised by the twist at the end with a new Lady Luck being born. I was surprised the task force didn't ask how Lady Luck actually found her victims. Well, I think they put it together, right? Didn't Rom kind of put it together? Eventually, yes. Eventually. Yeah. All yeah, right. and I was I was surprised by the daughter taking over. So I guess they got me there, but not by Smokey. Smokey, I saw that like first meeting. Right, right. In fact, I was kind of surprised I didn't shoot him in that scene, but that's too bad. What are you gonna do? What, what are you gonna, gonna do? do? All right, Carolyn Steele. N well, not a fan of this episode. So we're getting not a lot of not a fans of the episode. I'm still pretty hung up on Katarina Rostova going from being a virtual ghost of legendary status who people doubted even existed to this MJ who looks like he would have been about five years old running point for agency when Langley was, was hunting her to being able to dig up the identity of her mother makes no sense. I will concur. That's pretty crazy that nobody put this together earlier. And I concur that MJ moisturizes. It's a beautiful man. I don't tell you. All right. Uh, probably the best one that we got in this week, though. Uh, Anita said, well, there is a part in the conversation between Red and Diane Fowler that goes something like this. I know the truth, Red, about that night, about what happened to your family. Do you want to know the truth? To which Red replies, if you know the truth, somebody else knows it, too. And then, bam, shoots her. Maybe Red assumes his mother had died, but she might not have. If Red is Katarina or Katarina's brother, the logic consequence to this is that if Dom knows and pretends not to or otherwise, it will definitely be a shocker to a lot of people if Katarina's mom is alive. So perspective. Back in season one, when this all goes down, we're all like, oh, he's talking about Red's kids and Red's wife and Red's, you know, Red's direct family. What if it was all about Red's parents? 
and not about his kids. Hmm. Interesting. That would be fascinating, wouldn't it? It would be fascinating. Hmm. I like that. What happened to your family? And now that we know that Diane Fowler and Fitch were working together, and we know that Fitch and Katerina were working together, just saying. I like this. Okay. All right. It's going to be a fun couple weeks, probably. Yeah, I, I, this 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 has me intrigued for the rest of how this is going to play out. How do you feel about the the several that said they weren't a fan of this episode? I, I mean, I, I said kind of the same thing. It's I could see how with what we've had with the Aram stuff and and uh, Mojan leaving the show, and then what we have what's coming with the third estate and the president and Anna McMahon and the super secret special episode that's coming. Um, yeah, all of that that's happened. Like this would have been a perfect place for the quote unquote filler week. Uh, and, and it maybe it felt a little bit like a filler leak, but at the same time, I don't think it was all that bad. I think it was actually really full of a lot of parallelisms and mythology in a way that just wasn't over the head beat you explain it to you up front. If you're a fan of the blacklist, I think this is a, one of those episodes you come back to when it's all done and go, Oh crap, the clues were right in front of me and I just didn't want to see it. Yeah. I believe it's a set in the stage kind of episode. It is. And I really like the Blacklister, so I, I can't agree that I didn't like I thought it was a, a really interesting one, and it's a much more personal one than a lot of them. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. All right, well, that'll conclude this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at the Blacklist GSM, where we live tweet during the East Coast feed when possible, and we use the show's hashtag, The Blacklist. Don't forget to follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and join the Facebook group. Just search for The Blacklist Exposed. Talk about the show, the podcast, or your gambling vice. <laughs> Big I, thanks I, for I, I only play when it goes over like 200 million. Man, That's I it. play, I play craps, right? That's what I play when I when I go to Vegas. I win every single time if I stick to my strategy, which is I only bet on six and eight. That's the thing. When you go and play craps, you only bet on six and eight. But as soon as you start winning a lot, you start getting stupid, and that's where I lose it every time. Whenever we went to the casino in college, because you're college, you didn't have a lot of money. Thirty bucks went on the left side of the table, and then you played blackjack at three dollar minimums. And that was it. Whatever you win goes on the right. And so when mm. the left side was gone, you were done for the night because you said, I, I'm guaranteed I'm going to lose 30 bucks. So that way you knew exactly what you had to play with. And then whenever the left side was gone, you walked up from the table and took whatever's on the right hand side, which is hopefully enough for a bus ticket to get home. <laughs> I get too caught up in the excitement. So I can't, I don't even bring my ATM card. <laughs> so I start winning. I'm like, snake eyes, hundred bucks. Wait, what? Oh, that's only a one time bet. <laughs> I thought, I thought it stayed for a while. All right. Don't forget. Big thanks for listening. Don't forget to answer a profiling question. Is Katarina's mother still alive? Figure out soon. I'm sure. And we'll see you next week. Thank you guys. See you next week. Until next time. I'm agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit. Well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie, right? We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.